The Sidmouth Folk Festival has a long and usually glorious history, and here to help me understand it, I'm joined by Derek Schofield, historian of the festival. Derek, thanks very much for joining us. How did it all start, all the way back in 1955? Yes, 1955. Um, well, it was originally organised by the English Folk Dance and Song Society, um, who had... Um, been doing sort of summer vacation courses for many years and there was a great boom in folk dancing and square dancing in the early 1950s and they've been running a festival at Stratford-upon-Avon but then they wanted somewhere else to organise it and one of the people that worked for them said well I've just recently moved into Sidmouth and it's a lovely location so they decided to have a a week-long festival here and at first there were just a hundred folk dancers came uh, dancing for themselves but also dancing for the uh, holiday makers uh, and that's how it started it was very very small scale to start off with and what was the British folk scene like back then because you know it's the beginning 1955 beginning of rock and roll there were all sorts of other sort of sub genres and subcultures especially of youth music yes. the recording industry was being taken over really so what was folk like back in 55 well there wasn't very much uh, folk song at that stage that folk song revival was in its very early days and in fact there was almost no song in the first few years of the festival uh, it, it was all it was all folk dance but gradually uh, folk song came in folk singers like the place like Sidmouth in as much as the folk dancers and it grew and grew and um, particularly came into the 60s and they really started uh, having more folk events but still very small scale I mean they you know the two principal um, places venues for the folk song side was the drill hall which we can probably see in the background only a very very small hall over there. and uh, and what they call the beach store which was not as some people said where they kept the beach during the winter where they kept the deck chairs during the winter so that was a very very small location uh, and uh, but of course it got bigger and bigger and um, and then it's uh, the person that was involved as director then Bill Rutter was very much an internationalist and he started inviting overseas dance groups to come uh, and um, and eventually they moved into a big open-air natural amphitheatre just on the uh, 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 just in the town and uh, and then it really started to take off and folks on the side started to take off and they started to put up marquees like the one in the background here um, that you can hear the music from uh, and so it just developed year by year year by year and uh, it was always the place you know Sidmouth was the festival, the, the premier festival really, um, of the, the traditional, more on the traditional folk side, folk song, folk dance, Morris dancers, sword dancers, and, all, and these international dance groups. And then by the 1970s, folk really was big, it was a massive sort yes. of uh, cultural change. Uh, what was Sidmouth's role in that? Yeah, well, it, it was a, a lot of initiatives actually came from, uh, from Sidmouth. The first workshops for women's Morris dancing took place in Sidmouth uh, and uh, a lot of interest in the 70s in English uh, instrumental music and, uh, and instrumental dance music and a lot of initiatives took place here for, for that and of course the, the festival you know is, is not just concerts it's uh, a lot of workshops so the people were coming here learning Morris dancing, sword dancing uh, instrumental music and then taking it back to their homes and, and spreading it in that way uh, and, um, and a children's festival as well that was very early on children and then it's expanded into youth programs as well. I mentioned the 1970s, a lot of the performers that we'll be seeing this week, we're on the first day of the festival now, uh, they they first started coming here from the 1970s. There are yeah. people here whose careers were made back then. Indeed, yes. Are there people yeah. people here who are aware of the fact that they're only in employment because of Sidmouth? Uh, yes, you know, it, it, it's certainly a boost to people, you know, people who get booked at Sidmouth, you know, whoa, I've been booked at Sidmouth, that's a, you know, a feather in the cap, really, uh, over the years. And, you know, the, the festival changes, it changes every year uh, and develops and, you know, artist, for artistic reasons as well as for every other reason. And, uh, you know, and a, a lot of... Um, a lot of artists have uh, their careers have been boosted from from it here, but but as I say, it's that grassroots, you know, ability to learn 
you know, um, new skills and uh, new music and uh, and so on. That, that is a really very important part of Sydney. Some people involved in the music industry can't play an instrument or sing, but they're really interested in that foul creature money. Occasionally, that <laughs> does uh, raise its head. What happened in two thousand and five? Uh, well, um, as I said, the English Folk Dance and Song Society started it. Um, it. It was getting bigger and bigger and getting a bigger proportion of, of their overall, overall annual turnover by the 1980s. So it, uh, it, um, it changed then and uh, um, a group of people uh, took over the festival organising it. Uh, and they... Um, you know, they grew it again and, and, and changed it again. But, of course, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's a big financial risk from that. Uh, so, um, but the people that were running it then decided, you know, this is the time to, to, to change. That was in the festival's 50th year. Um, and um, so then there was the decision, you know, what will happen? And it looked as if it was going to stop altogether. So a group of people who have been very enthusiastically involved in it over a number of years got together and put together a festival for the following year, smaller scale. Um, we no longer had the big arena with the overseas teams getting increasingly difficult to get those. But, you know, it, it rescued it, <coughs> excuse me, rescued it and carried on from 2005. And then it's grown and grown in a different way, but it's still expanded and uh, and succeeded you know by when you say money but money is important but nobody's in it here to to organize this to make any money i can assure you <laughs> i've mentioned your book published in 2004 a uh, couple of questions here where can i get it <laughs> And uh, are you writing the follow-up? Ah, well, um, yes, I wrote the book uh, the first week in August uh, for the, the history of the festival um, in uh, 2004, 50th year. Um, and, well, it's obviously long since out of print, although there are a few copies knocking around. Um, and... Uh, yeah, now it's almost 20 years since then. I'm not. I'm busy in other directions at the moment, so there's no follow-up just at the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah. And I, re and I reckon even you've been looking at the long history of this festival. You reckon that folk and Sidmouth are both thriving and living on each other? They are, yes. But you know, we're in difficult financial times as always, and um, you know, we just uh, keep working very, very hard to uh, keep the festival going and prospering. Derek, thank you very much. That's superb. Thanks very thank much you. and good luck with the sequel. Thank you.